Hello and welcome to today's lesson on exoplanets, which is part of the astrophysics topic in AQA A-level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at understanding how to detect exoplanets. So if we've been successful and learned in today's lesson, we should be able to detail what an exoplanet is and how they are so difficult to detect directly, understand how exoplanets can be detected via the radial method, Un and understand how exoplanets can be detected via the transit method, including the appropriate light curve, which links into the following part of the AQA A-level physics specification the astrophysics option 3.9.3.4, the detection of exoplanets. So an exoplanet or an extrasolar planet is a planet located outside the solar system orbiting a star that is not our sun. Now the first confirmation of an exoplanet orbiting a main sequence star was made in 1995 when a giant planet was found in a four day orbit around a nearby star 51 Pegasi. Now the definition of an exoplanet is a planet which is located around a star which is not the sun. So as we mentioned before, it would mark a breakthrough when we found this planet 51 Pegasi and it was a prototype for a class of planets we now call hot Jupiters. So it's important to note that some exoplanets have been imaged directly by telescopes but the vast majority have been detected with indirect methods such as the transit method or the radial velocity method. So whilst we can actually observe some exoplanets directly with our telescopes the majority have actually been um, discovered indirectly as you can see on the following diagram. Now it's important to note that we use multiple methods today to confirm the existence of an exoplanet. So this is because there are associated issues with each separate method of exoplanet detection. So why do we not um, just find all of our exoplanets directly? Well it's actually very difficult to detect an exoplanet directly with a telescope based on or around the Earth. The first issue is that exoplanets are orbiting a star which is much brighter than they are. So the exoplanets are drowned out from the bright light emitted from the star that they are orbiting. And the second issue is that the angular separation between the star and the exoplanet is much smaller than the minimum angular separation of our telescopes. So the planets which are actually far enough away to be resolved are likely to be very dim as they'll not reflect much light. So you can see there's several issues when we try to detect exoplanets directly. But despite this, several exoplanets have been di directly imaged. They tend to be very large and in large orbits, and they are also likely to be hot, so they can be found from their infrared they emit, rather than from the reflected light from their star. But it also does help if the planet orbits a brown dwarf or an another dim star, so it's not drowned out by the star it orbits. Now, technology has advanced, and various masking techniques have been developed to block out the light from stars, so that planets orbiting them might be directly imaged. But still to this day, only the largest, hottest exoplanets, which orbit at a large distance from their star, can be detected directly. So as we would say, this method can detect Jupiter-like planets as opposed to Earth-like planets. So this means that other methods must be used to detect exoplanets. So a different method, as opposed to di uh, directly imaging the exoplanet, is called the radial velocity method. Now the radial velocity method uses the concept of the Doppler effect to detect exoplanets. Now when a planet orbits a star, the star and the exoplanet co-orbit around a common center of mass, which is actually very close to the star's core. This is because the mass of the, the most of the mass of the star system is found in the star. So for example, in our own solar system, 99.8% of the mass of the solar system is found in the sun. So what this means is that whilst the exoplanet will orbit around the star, the actual star will have a slight variation and wobble on its axis as it's rotating about a point inside of itself. So what this means is from the Earth, when the star wobbles towards us, our telescopes on Earth will observe its electromagnetic radiation being a blue shifted because it's coming towards us. Whilst when the star is wobbling away from our telescopes on Earth, its electromagnetic magnetic spectrum appears to be red shifted. Now this red shift and blue shift is periodic 
periodic as the star will periodically wobble as the star orbits. So this red shifting and blue shifting is periodic and leads to a method called the Doppler spectroscopy. Now the larger the planet, the greater the wobble of the star, so the greater the red and blue shift, whilst the smaller the planet, the less the wobble of the star, so the less the red and the blue shift. So this allows us to determine the mass of the planet. So this red shifting and blue shifting allows us to determine the minimum mass of the planet which is causing this effect. But there are issues with this method. This effect is only noticeable when the exoplanet is close in size to that of the star. So this method can only really be used to detect Jupiter-like planets as opposed to Earth-like planets. And the second issue is that the movement of the star needs to be aligned with the observer's line of sight. So if a planet orbits the star perpendicular to our line of sight, there'd be no detectable shift for our telescopes. So to get a measurable result, the star must orbit edge on to the viewpoint of the Earth. So this means we've also got to use other methods to detect other exoplanets. So another method that we use to detect exoplanets is called the transit method. Now the transit method measures the change in apparent magnitude as an exoplanet transits in front of a star from the viewpoint of Earth as it orbits the star. So if we look at the following diagram, you'll notice that before the exoplanet is between ourselves and the star, there's no change in the apparent magnitude of the star to the telescope on Earth. But as the exoplanet passes in between the star and our telescope, you'll notice that there's a dip in the apparent magnitude of the star to the telescope on Earth as the exoplanet is blocking out some of the radiation of the star. Now the larger the exoplanet compared to the star, the greater the dip in apparent magnitude. And the further away the exoplanet from the star, the longer the dip in apparent magnitude as it takes a longer time to fully transit across the entire star. Now you'll notice that once you pass the star, there's no change in apparent magnitude of the star to the telescope on Earth. So the apparent magnitude will return to its original value once the exoplanet has passed in between the line of sight of our telescope and the star. So it's important to note that you can see certain light curves due to this transit method. So here are some light curves for the Trappist exoplanets. So these planets were detected by the change in luminosity they appear to cause to the star when they pass in the plane of observation between the Earth and the star. So like we said before, the bigger a planet, the larger the drop in apparent magnitude, and the further away a planet from the star, the longer the drop in apparent magnitude. So this method allows you to determine the radius of a planet and its orbital distance from the star. So you've got to really memorize the light curve for an exoplanet detected via the transit method. So it's important to note that planets are detected by the change in luminosity they appear to cause to the star when they pass in the plane of observation between the Earth and the star. Now, you can observe it in this particular light curve that before the exoplanet passes between the line of sight, there is no change in the brightness of the star, but as it passes in between the line of sight of the star and the telescope, you'll observe a dip in the brightness, which is our light curve. Now, you can see in this particular example a periodic or repeating dipping in the apparent magnitude of the star. That's because many other processes can cause the shape of the light curve, such as sunspots or variations in the output of the star itself or other stellar objects such as comets can cause this particular dip in apparent magnitude. But periodic dips in apparent magnitude are needed to confirm the existence of an exoplanet. At least three periodic dips are needed to establish an exoplanet. But there are issues when we use this transit method. Issue number one, a dip in the light curve can be caused by other effects. And the second issue is that periodic dips such as three periodic dips can take a very long time to establish so it could take many years to establish if it's actually a planet and not just another stellar object. And the third issue is that the alignment must be correct for the planet and star to eclipse in the plane of the Earth, which unfortunately is very unlikely. Now even if it is aligned, the transit is likely to last a tiny fraction of the whole orbital period, thus makes them easy to miss. And so this means that this alignment issue, this alignment issue means that the 
method can only be used to confirm existing exoplanets and not actually rule out exoplanets around a star. Because it means if no dip is observed, it doesn't always mean that there's no planet there, only that it's not aligned with us. So like we just said, this means that this method can only confirm the existence of exoplanets and not rule out any star system. So it tells us that multiple methods of detection must be used to find out as much information about an exoplanet as possible and to ensure that the issues with detection are not a hindrance. So if we've been successful and learnt in today's lesson, we should be able to detail what an exoplanet is and how they are so difficult to detect directly, understand how exoplanets can be detected via the radial method, and finally understand how exoplanets can be detected via the transit method and include appropriate light curves. So I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on exoplanets, which is part of the astrophysics topic in AQA A-level physics. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, have a lovely day.